The Bible explicitly allows you to enslave non-Jews forever, stating that they are your property and can be passed on to your children, and that you can beat them as long as they don't die within two or three days. All of this is in right. the Bible. All right, so if you want to cherry pick verses to fit your own beliefs, you can go to Exodus 21, verse 20 and 21, and completely ignore the first 20 chapters about Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, because God's people were being mistreated. And Exodus 21, if you actually read it in context, it actually just proves that this man has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. So if a man strikes his slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall surely be punished. And a quick note here, the Hebrew word translated as punish usually means avenge or vengeance or revenge in the Old Testament. And also verse 12 of the same chapter, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Also, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. So taking someone against their will, for Forcing them to work for you without pay is actually condemned by God in the Old Testament. This is why if you want to understand the book of Exodus, you should read the entire book of Exodus instead of cherry picking verses like this guy usually does. If a day or two he is able to stand, no punishment or revenge shall be taken for he is his property. Let's just look a little bit further though. Oh, what's this? If a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and ruins it, he shall let him go free on the count of his eye. Wow, sounds, sounds fair to me. If you mistreat your slave, let your slave go free. If he knocks out a a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. Guys, if I was poor in 1500 BC, I had no cattle, money, food, shelter, water, I would love to become a slave in this environment where God is holding his people accountable if they mistreat their slaves. How is any of it moral? None of that slavery is a slavery that we think in a Western Mike, world. your claim that this isn't like the slavery from American history is complete and total bullshit. You see how angry he's getting? It's because he knows he's wrong. I recommend you do some research on the slave Bible, where slave owners in the 1800s took out parts of the Bible. Examples of excluded passages in the slave Bible include Exodus 21. He who kidnaps a man shall be put to death. I just told you, and it says that you can beat them and that they are your property. Yes, of course, you can beat anyone, but you're gonna have to face the consequences. You reap what you sow. This is a biblical principle. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You guys know this. If you You've read the Bible, of course. How is it moral to have another human being as property? Guys, as I said before, owning another human being isn't inherently immortal. If I had a child and he grows up and he's five years old, I still basically own him. He has to do whatever I tell him to do because he's irresponsible. But of course, if I mistreat him, I should be punished. And be permitted to beat them. I don't care if they beat them regularly. I don't care if they were nice to them on the Sabbath. How is it moral to say that one human being can own another another human being is property and beat them. Like I said, we've already disproved his entire Christians argument all here. all around the world avoid this question because they intrinsically understand that it's not moral and they cannot reconcile this with the fact that it's in a Bible that they want to adhere to as a literal moral guide. I guess it just takes a lot of pride, narcissism, entitlement to think that being owned by someone else is inherently immortal. You see, I'm actually owned by the creator of the universe. I am a slave to him and I wouldn't have it any other way. I would not want to be a slave to myself. The the last thing a Christian wants is autonomy. After the resurrection and I'm conformed to the image of Christ, I'm going to be perfect, just like my God, because I'm going to be doing his will for eternity, not my own. Also, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He is the same God that made those rules in the Old Testament. And if you read Matthew chapter 5 through 7, you'll notice that this is impeccable morality. Do not judge that you won't be judged. This is literally where the golden rule comes from. Therefore, in all things, whatever you want people to do to you, so do for them. For this is the law and the prophet. The entirety of the law can be summed up in that verse. Also, we are not under the old covenant anymore. I don't have to slaughter lambs for my sin because Jesus is the perfect spotless lamb. If you believe in Jesus and you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in step with the Spirit. See, I don't understand why people go to the Old Testament and think that they're doing something by cherry picking these verses. It's really weird. You're meant to read books start to finish, not just parts, <laughs> you know, like I don't get it.